Well, we have a very exciting show for all you uranium bulls out there. I know how little this area is covered, but I mean, we have uranium Twitter. The people are interested in uranium. We're even seeing it on Wall Street Bets as Rowan Reddy explains in our future interview. So you are not going to want to miss that, especially if you're a uranium bull. And I relate from 2010 to 2014, uh, as a subscriber to the Dines letter, I had was definitely a uranium stock investor with mixed results. Had I gotten out you know, early on before Fukushima, I would have done spectacularly. Following painful years, though, uh, were very painful financially, but that's how the junior markets go. Quick shout out to James Dines. Huge crypto guy, by the way. For those who are wondering, for all you, you know, and I say this endearingly, all you old school guys out there who are fans of James Dines, but maybe not of crypto, James Dines is a massive crypto bull. Just so you know, that's actually what converted me. I, I was listening to Raul Pal for months on Real Vision. Once I heard this rare interview with James Dines from last August, I just went out and I was like, I got to figure out how to do this. You know, it's actually pretty complicated. You got to get a wallet and it's kind of, you know, am I going to lose all my money? How do I even buy this stuff? Anyway, today is about uranium. And we have Rowan Reddy back from Global X ETFs, one of the biggest ETFs in the space. And uranium has been incredibly interesting the last you know, a couple of months, it's gone up about 50%, maybe more since mid-August. So it's been dramatic. And finally, Cameco seems to have broken out, out of its channel. But as we'll discuss in the interview, I mean, they had their big strategy, which was to put pressure on the supply by shutting down Cigar Lake and buying off the spot market in order to fulfill their orders. And as I was discussing with Rowan Reddy, it's, it seems as though they got caught on the wrong side of the trade when all of a sudden the price of uranium rose 50%. So very interesting interview. As always, we're going to have to have Rowan Reddy back on just commodities in general, which he is also an expert in. And yeah, another really fascinating part of this interview, Wall Street Bats has jumped on the uranium train in particular Cameco, and Rowan has a few things to say about that. So a really cool interview. If uranium is your deal, we have a wonderful show lined up for you. We had the Global Mining Symposium last week, and from all reports, it sounds like it went very well. We have a story on the website on ESG and how on values and thought leadership panel. So, yeah, lots going on, and wow, what a market we are in right now. It seems to be really at an inflection point. Bulls are turning bearish. You know, long-term bulls are starting to turn a bit bearish here. We have the 10-year bond rising pretty dramatically as well. What do we have here? So it's 1.53%. So we are almost 0.2% above where we were last week. So... The bond market seems to be telling us something. The oracle, as I like to call it, the tea leaves called the U.S. 10-year bond is trying to tell us something. It would seem 1.53. So yields are going higher. Now, as we all know, in a big crisis, when we get a deflation, bond yields go down. They go down to almost nothing because there is an incredible demand for bonds, the perceived safety in bonds. Conversely, if we're to see bond yields go up, does that mean is the bond market starting to be concerned about inflation? Is it seeing more of a risk on situation coming? So another very interesting dynamic in this strange world of ours where Wall Street bets is betting on uranium stocks. So with that, if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at northernminer. Find us on Instagram at The Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud. And with that, let's turn to the news. And turning to the website, we have a story of 
39 workers trapped in Totem Mine in Canada. And this is a valet mine. And this is from mining.com. And it says here, Valet SA, one of the world's biggest producers of iron ore and nickel, expects all 39 workers trapped in an underground mine since Sunday to be freed by tonight. And this was written on September 27th. So that was last night. I did a search. I didn't see any news that they had come out yet. Uh, Workers at the Totem Mine in Sudbury, Ontario, are safe, uninjured, and beginning their ascent via a ladder system with the support of a rescue team. The Rio de Janeiro-based company said in a statement on Monday, the 39 people were trapped after an excavator that was being transported into the mine dislodged, blocking the shaft. They proceeded to refuge stations, have access to food and water, and have been in frequent contact with above-ground staff. So it sounds like one of their elevators, basically, and I use that in quotes, uh, broke down. Valley shares fell on the news before recovering as the incident invoked memories of the 2010 San Jose mine cave in in Chile, where 33 men were trapped for 69 days before being lifted to safety. While Totten is a far more sophisticated operation than San Jose, the accident may hinder Valley's efforts to boost its environmental, social, and governance credentials in the wake of two Brazilian tailings disasters in the past six years. It is quite a record, isn't it? That Valley has. Like they are somehow often associated with these mega disasters. Now, are they the biggest? I think, or is it the BHP is the biggest? Rio Tinto is the second biggest. So, but Valley is definitely up there. We're doing everything we can, and we have a quote We're doing everything we can to ensure the safety of these employees, and we'll provide further updates as they become available. And Totten is a nickel mine and produces 4% of the company's total. And output is suspended, and Valet is assessing necessary measures to resume production. So we wish the miners well over there. It sounds like they're going to be okay. And yeah, we have another CBC article, basically says the same thing. Yeah, it says here, the conveyance system for transporting employees, this is according to CBC, commonly called a cage, was damaged when it was used to move a large piece of equipment that collided with it. So you could just imagine that happening. It sounds like they're quite well prepared, though, for this, like to the company's credit so far, that at least there's food and water. But it must be kind of, you know, you wonder if there's going to be a couple of guys that might just resign from the job after something like that happening. Moving on, Peru uh, is facing some road blockades, which is forcing MMG to halt production at the Las Bambas copper mine. This by Cecilia Jamazmi. says here, Chinese miner MMG once again will have to halt its operations at its Las Bambas copper mine in Peru, one of the country's largest, as community protests in the nearby province of Chumbivilcas have affected supply logistics. It's almost a bit of a supply chain issue from the sounds of it. The blockade on public roads along Peru's major copper transport corridor has impacted the company's concentrate shipments and sales, the company says. While production at the asset continues, the company expects ongoing disruptions will force it to halt the operations sometime this week. MMG said protests relate to local demands for more logistics transport contracts, as well as classification of these communities as an area of direct influence. The miner said locals had rejected company proposals for social development. It added it was pursuing, quote, active coordination with the Peruvian government and communities to reach an agreement. Now, this is something that George McLeod brought up. And I don't know if this is what's going on here, but he mentions a lot of times these Chinese companies will bring in their own workers. And one wonders how much that might be having an effect here or if that's going on at all. But yeah, it makes you wonder if the locals feel like they're not getting enough out of the deal, if that's what's going on here. I don't know. The announcement comes less than a month after a bus in the Peruvian Andes transporting contract workers at Las Bambas fell off a cliff, killing 16 people and injuring two. Road blockades, frequently followed by shipment suspension, has been a common issue affecting the massive copper mine since its 2015-2016 ramp-up. And finally, overall, the mine was disrupted for more than 100 days in 2019, with more than 70 communities along the 450-kilometer road to the port of Matarani, demanding action from MMG and the national government over emissions from trucks and reduction of their farmlands. A three-week-long roadblock protest staged at the end of 2020 prevented MMG from exporting 189,000 tons of copper concentrate worth $530 million from the mine. So 
as they say, social license, MMG perhaps has some work to do in that regard. Turning to our next story, we have this surprising story for me on China's power crunch and how the nickel price is tumbling on the power crunch. And it actually, this it sounds like it's becoming more of a problem, this Chinese power crisis. And I wasn't really aware of it till just frankly this week, but it's starting to explain a lot of things that are going on. First of all, let's just take a look at the story. The nickel price declined along with most metals as China's power crisis spread from factories to residents, adding risks to supply chains, demand, and economic recovery. And this is probably just the last thing that the supply chain needs is a power crisis out of China. Residents in several northern provinces have already been dealing with blackouts while traffic lights are being turned off. Nickel fell as much as 2.9% on the LME. Zinc declined 0.9%, while copper rose 0.3%. Tin dropped 4.3%. I don't know how much we can attribute any of those moves to power being turned off in China, but it's possible. Restrictions on power use in Chinese home have only just taken effect, so it sounds like it's getting worse, doesn't it? However, China's massive industrial base has been wrestling with sporadic jumps in power prices and usage curbs since at least March, when provincial authorities in Inner Mongolia ordered some heavy industry, including an aluminum smelter, to curb use so the province could meet its energy use target for the first quarter. So, you know, this really explains to me the one of the big reasons behind the Bitcoin miners being kicked out of China the power consumption, you know, arguably one of the strongest arguments against Bitcoin, you know, it, it consumes a lot of power. And so that story, which happened around April, May, it's interesting in the context of this bigger story of there being a bit of an energy crunch in China. Now, I don't think it says here in the article what the cause of this is. Like, why is this happening? But it does seem to be happening. Is this because they're trying to reduce their carbon footprint? Like, I'm not sure why this is happening. Economists at Nomura Holdings and China International Capital have downgraded their growth forecasts as electricity shortages force businesses to cut back on production. So there is, you know, it's just another weird story out of China. Uh, there's the crackdown on basically the large capitalists, the successful capitalists in China. There is the crackdown on effeminate men in China. You know, there's Evergrande. Now there's a power crisis. There's the crypto crackdown. And just the other day, we had the comments from President Xi describing Taiwan as a, I think it was a dire situation is what he called it there. So, you know, China, like things are happening over there in the sense that I don't get the sense that business as usual is going on there. Like, it's, again, I think a lot of people have been surprised at uh, President Xi's ambition, his political ambition. And because we're seeing some pretty, I guess, for lack of a better word, draconian moves out of China and what seems to be a move back to socialism. So apparently nickel prices are being affected by this. Not too badly, as we're going to see in the nickel uh, in metal prices. Nevertheless, uh, turning to our next story, Kirkland Lake shares have risen on a M&A rumor. It's by Henry Lazenby. So Kirkland Lake Gold rose nearly 8.5% in early trading after IKN News. I assume that's Inca-Cola News. Uh, I don't really read Inca-Cola News, so I'm not sure. I know it's kind of well-read within the industry, but this is a rumor, okay? And IKN News released a statement Sunday, saying the gold miner was, quote, marketing itself to the highest bidder. According to the report, the sales process is in an advanced stage with at least four companies still in the process. And, quote, one has now emerged as a clear favorite, end quote, although that company is not specified. Quote, this deal could be announced at any moment and is the driving force behind KL's or Kirkland Lake Gold's share price outperformance these last two weeks. According to the report, Kirkland Lake Gold recently increased its measured and indicated resource base for its Detour Lake Gold mine in Ontario by 211%. The news is stoking speculation in online investor forums that a major producer such as Barrick Gold might be a potential suitor to gain control of the Detour asset. If the rumor turns out to be true, and if Barrick is involved, one might expect another no-premium deal to emerge. Now, we don't have a market cap here, but my impression is that Kirkland Lake has gone on quite a run 
in the last two years. So I'm a little skeptical that Barrick is going to be buying. I mean, if we go to the conference calls, Bristow did highlight that they wanted to focus on exploration uh, to grow the business. That being said, he did also mention that he was wanting to, in a sense, dive deeper into the Canadian jurisdiction and become even more entrenched in Canada, right, where he sees, you know, I think probably safety uh, and a, you know, a rich mining jurisdiction. So hard to say, again, all hearsay over here. And we have a final story here on the disinfecting properties of silver. Silver enhanced disinfectant has long lasting effects against COVID-19 and this is by Valentina Ruiz Leotode. Researchers at the University of Central Florida are using an engineered nanostructure called cerium oxide modified with a small amount of silver to produce a disinfectant that can continuously kill viruses on a surface for up to seven days. So isn't that great? Kill viruses on a surface for up to seven days. I would think all public transportation would like something like this. Cerium oxide is known for its regenerative antioxidant properties, and this development could be a powerful weapon against COVID-19 and other emerging pathogenic viruses, the researchers say. And this has been developed by UCF, University of Central Florida, in partnership with Kismet Technologies, whose founder, Christina Drake, said she was inspired to develop it after seeing a worker at a grocery store spraying disinfectant on a refrigerator handle, then wiping off the spray immediately. Quote, initially my thought was to develop a fast-acting disinfectant, but we spoke to consumers like doctors and dentists to find out what they really wanted from a disinfectant. What mattered the most to them was something long-lasting that would continue to disinfect high-touch areas like door handles and floors long after application. Absolutely. That is the magic. If they can do that, then we are in business. Mining to the rescue on COVID, the cerium oxide nanoparticle engineered disinfectant she came up with together with a team at UCF is already potent, but its properties increase with the added traces of silver. It works both chemically and mechanically, said Sudipta Seal, an expert in nanoscience and co-author of the study. The nanoparticles emit electrons that oxidize the virus, rendering it inactive. Mechanically, they also attach themselves to the virus and rupture the surface, almost like popping a balloon. Sounds like it's working on two fronts here. And finally, an interesting little thing on disinfectants here. According to Seal and Drake, most disinfecting wipes or sprays will disinfect a surface within three to six minutes of application but have no residual effects. This means surfaces need to be wiped down repeatedly to stay clean. The nanoparticle formulation, however, maintains its ability to inactivate microbes and continues to disinfect a surface for up to seven days after a single application. And it's also free of harmful chemicals. So hope from miners. I mean, we hear Robert Friedland talking about the antiviral properties of copper as well. So... Maybe another way the mining industry can rebrand itself. This is definitely one of the ways it can do it. Those are your news stories. And now let's take a look at metal prices. Turning to metal prices, we'd like to thank our friends once again at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And according to CNBC, however, the 10-year bond is at 1.546. So that is 0.21% higher. So quite a jump in the 10-year bond. Turning to precious metals, gold is at $1,742.22. That is $17 lower than last week. Silver is at $22.41 per ounce. That is eight cents higher than last week. Platinum is at $979.55 per ounce. That is $56 higher than last week. And palladium is at $1,950.62 per ounce. That is $42 higher than last week. And turning to our industrial metals, Copper is down seven cents at four dollars and twenty-one cents per pound. Aluminum is unchanged at a dollar thirty-two per pound. Lead is at ninety-eight cents per pound. That is down two cents from last week. Nickel is at eight dollars and seventy cents per pound. That is down forty cents from last week. 
Tin is at $17.02 per pound. That is 97 cents higher than last week. Cobalt is at $24.04 per pound. That is 85 cents higher than last week. And zinc is unchanged at $1.41 per pound. What do we see? Precious metals remain, frankly, a little depressed. Platinum and palladium inch up a little bit. Copper generally stays in its elevated trading range. Aluminum as well, lead as well, nickel as well, you know, just down slightly. Tin, there must be a bit of a supply constraint because that is the highest price we've seen in the last two years that we've been recording these prices. And, you know, it was two months ago when we hit $16.38, which was our previous high. And so this took that out completely. So we're above $17 per pound on tin. And again, two years ago, we were at $7.42. So we are two and a half X on tin. Cobalt also doing well and zinc staying at its, you know, basically, you know, record price of the last two years at a buck 41. So maybe that's what we're seeing in the 10 year is, you know, Jim Bianco was on a podcast, I think Macro Voices a couple of weeks ago. And he said, what's the opposite of transitory? And he said persistent. And what we're seeing here is persistent elevated industrial metal prices. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, we have Rowan Reddy, research analyst at Global X, a New York based provider of global exchange traded funds, including the popular Global X uranium ETF. And he is becoming a quick favorite of the program with his. Very deep insight into uranium and other commodities. This time we talk uranium. And yeah, fascinatingly, the impact of Wall Street bets. What's going on with Cameco's stock? The quick run-up in price. Sprott's Uranium Trust and much, much more. I hope you enjoy it and I will see you on the other side. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome back Rowan Reddy, research analyst at Global X, a New York based provider of global exchange traded funds, including the Global X Uranium ETF. Rowan, welcome back to the podcast. Great to be back, Adrian. It was very interesting and timely our last interview. You came pretty close to calling the uranium bottom, and at least that the price was going to go up. It has jumped remarkably, remarkably fast in the last, you know, six weeks. So tell us what's going on in uranium from your perspective. What has happened? How has the landscape changed? You know, just tell us what, what your big picture thoughts are on uranium. I think uh, what's been going on in uranium is you've started to see price discovery within a market that really did not have a ton of spot market liquidity. Um, this is something that's, I think, fairly new um, in the second half of the year. Uh, and even shortly after our discussion um, in March, uh, when we started seeing news that hedge funds were also entering uh, the spot market as well. So you've seen a lot of financial buyers enter the space. Clearly, I think uranium was also one of the commodities that began underperforming um, earlier in the year compared to other commodities, which were benefiting from inflation and um, some of that trade, but uranium was lagging behind a bit. So there was a bit of I would say both valuation uh, resetting on uranium since it had lagged for a while. Uh, and then you also saw a, a number of financial buyers start to enter the space at a time when there's a lot of good things happening for uranium. We're seeing uh, nuclear start to come up more within the energy and electricity mix globally. Uh, reactors are being built. So for a lot of the long-term reasons, there was also a lot of short-term demand stepping into the market. That's so interesting how you mention basically what, what sounds like investor demand and say hedge funds entering, because that's sort of my impression is that a lot of this, we've known for over 10 years that the fundamentals of uranium are off the charts and that this sooner or later should be a great investment. But it really seems like it got sped up a little bit in the last year or so as part of like almost a larger what I'd almost be tempted to call speculative mania in almost all assets in the stock market, crypto, commodities. Jeffrey Christian, who you probably know from CPM Group, the gold and precious metals analyst, one of his views is that 
most rise in the metals or change in prices is based on investor demand. And so I guess that's my very long-winded way of saying, do you think this is largely investor demand that's uh, pushing these prices higher, or is it something more? In, in the short term, I think it's very much investor demand um, that's bringing these prices up. So there's two things. First, you have both the physical spot market buying that we mentioned by some of these hedge funds and also these closed end trusts um, that are now coming up in the market. And the second thing is there are ETFs out there. So number one is ours, ticker URA. Uh, then there's a couple others out there that have started to see a lot of investor demand. And the reason why that's important is because uranium, it's still a pretty small industry, right? If you look at the public equity cap, uh, it's somewhere maybe in the 20 billion range, uh, give or take. So it's still fairly small. And then when you have ETFs that hold, you know, 500 million to a billion dollars or north of that in assets, a lot of times they'll own, you know, in the range of say three to 10% of the shares outstanding. Um, and if you start getting more investor flow into those products, um, that also drives some of these stocks up. So I think it's a combination of both demand for the underlying stocks that is improving, but also more importantly for the industry, something that's kind of new is this price discovery aspect uh, from some of the spot market buyers. Yeah, and maybe you could go deeper into what we mean by, say, price discovery. I mean, my understanding of price discovery is, say, if if a commodity goes above its previous all-time highs, then we start to enter price discovery. But how how do you understand price discovery? Price discovery is a, it's a concept, actually, that um, I think is more popular in the fixed income space, the bond space, because uh, some of those bonds don't really trade daily. And if you look at maybe mutual funds or ETFs, um, those have almost become, quote unquote, price discovery vehicles because there is daily pricing on those. That's kind of what we mean for uranium as well. There isn't really the same level of futures and swap market liquidity mm -hmm. like you would have in oil and gas or for copper or some of these very large well-known commodities. Right now, you know, the best uh, area to look for price discovery before was some of those ETFs and some of those stocks um, out there. So typically, a lot of times when there would be a bull run in uranium, it would actually happen earlier uh, in the months prior with some of those financial buyers, either, you know, buying up um, underlying uh, reserves, or you would actually see buying into some of those public equity stocks or the ETFs. So because uranium is still a fairly small industry without you know, a ton of real liquidity within the spot market or even in terms of financial instruments that trade out there, uh, quite like other commodities in the future space, that's why there wasn't a ton of price discovery before. And you sort of leaned on some of those other uh, instruments like an ETF or like um, some of the public stocks in Canada or Australia out there that had daily pricing to actually know what the price discovery was. Today, we're getting price discovery because there actually is buying in the spot market, whether it's hedge funds that do so sporadically because they like the valuations and they think that um, long-term pricing is going to go up, or you know, you do have that Sprott uh, closed-end trust that has raised about $1.3 billion in assets, um, and they bought up around 28 million pounds of uh, spot uranium. So that's actually real buyers entering the space, and they need to transact in it. So you're getting true price discovery there. I see what you're saying. So it's because it, it is sort of well known as a opaque market, as Tim Gitzel said. So we're literally discovering the price is, is kind of what you're saying. That's or, exactly or, correct. Yeah. Okay, great. And and yeah, you took us to exactly where I want to go because we have this Sprott ETF and it seems to have really kind of accelerated the price. I mean, we've seen in the last six weeks, it looks like about a 50% move. And now we're, I was just on Cameco's site and uh, they're one of the places you can get a price for uranium and it's just above $50. I'm not sure if that was a long-term. Yeah, we have UXC and Trade Tech. Do you happen to know, are these the long-term or the short-term price? Because I knew, know there is a difference between the two. Yeah, so there is um, long-term and short-term pricing. So UXC, uh, Cameco actually publishes both on their website, long-term and short-term pricing. I think the short-term pricing right now is somewhere in the north of $50 range, uh, and the long-term is lagging a little bit, if I remember correctly. Okay, excellent. Thank you for, for that. And so now, as far as Sprott is concerned, what are your thoughts? Like when I heard this, I almost was, I think I mentioned on the last show, I was, was almost thinking to myself, like, 
You know, if I was the regulators here, and I mean, I guess you're in the business of creating a uranium ETF of sorts, but I mean, if someone starts buying up a huge amount, like you say, if he starts buying up a billion dollars of a $20 billion market, I mean, at what point does this start to become like the Hunt brothers and that whole cornering of a market? Like, or, you know, if, you would think with something like nuclear, it's so strategic. Does that cross your mind at all? Or am I just sort of uh, kind of, you know, overthinking this and this is purely markets at work? Yeah, I was listening to a conversation from uh, the Sprott CEO um, last week, and he had mentioned that this was not market timing. This was not something that was a flash in the pan, and they decided to do it right away. This had been planned out years in advance, and Sprott also has a lot of expertise in the commodities markets. Um, they also do things in uh, the precious metals markets, too. So they have a lot of experience managing um, some of these types of assets. And uranium is probably something that came up on their radar because, as we mentioned, there wasn't really a real liquid vehicle. There was demand um, from both retail investors and institutional investors for some type of uh, physical buying vehicle like they were doing. And I think they kind of got maybe a little bit lucky with the timing uh, because it was at a time when you know the uranium market after COVID-19 it flipped from being a very soft market to a very tight market almost right away because there were a ton of mining closures, Cigar Lake being uh, the best example, mm. which Chemico shut down twice. Then you also saw other uranium mines that had to be put on hold. So this was a very tight market to begin with um, starting the year. And then, you know, once they started getting all their approvals in place and they decided that they were going to go ahead with the uh, merger that they had to actually become a physical buying entity. I think it just happened to work out where the timing was uh, absolutely brilliant on their standpoint because they were able to enter that market and kind of have a big impact on the prices. Now, to your question about the regulatory side, um, yeah, I mean, uranium is probably one of the most regulated commodity markets um, just because of the strategic nature. And a lot of times it crosses borders and there's sort of a nascent understanding of kind of inventories and that kind of thing. So it does make sense that they would probably have had to go through a lot of approval processes in order to get this done, not even accounting for the fact that they had to take into account like investor demand on top of it. So they did also mention that they're looking to list a similar vehicle in the United States. I think that's going to be a heavier lift for them. Um, and they did mention that um, just because U.S. regulatory processes for listing uh, these type of investment vehicles is a little bit more stringent. You know, if you're listing something like an exchange traded fund, it's a little bit easier. But if you're buying up underlying commodities like uranium, which are well regulated, I think this is going to take them a little bit longer than that Canadian vehicle. So it's good that they were able to get the Canadian um, listing out because it does enable price discovery, as we said, it kind of captures some of the investor demand like we already saw. Uh, they're at the market program went from 300 million in assets to they upsized it to 1.3 billion. So clearly there's a lot of demand. I do think though, if they're able to get that US listing, uh, which will probably take a little bit of time, that it is going to be um, a longer process for them than what they've had now. I would think like, I, I just find it hard to imagine that the you know US government is just going to say, yes, go ahead and buy all the uranium so that all our nuclear power providers can you know spend five times as much so you guys can all make a fortune. Like, it just seems like, uh, you know, I, I'm all for capitalism, but I just, I would just be surprised that they would allow something like that. Okay, so turning to the stocks. So I looked at Cameco, for example, and I saw like it kind of had a nice run up and then it kind of I was looking at Google here and it, it went up to say $24 US and then it's pulled back. So what's going on now? Has the Because it seems like the price is still fairly high at $50. Is that Cameco itself or were, did all the stocks pull back? Uh, what's going on with the stocks? Yeah, I think um, one point that uh, a lot of people might not be in favor of, but we sort of have to bring up is the Reddit effect of what's been happening with uranium and kind of becoming a, a sort of a meme stock in a sense. Uh, Cameco was the other week one of the most talked about, and I think was actually the number one talked about uh, stock on Wall Street bets. So there was a little bit of technical buying and selling that I think that's been happening that is sort of dislocated from reality. Why it became that way, I think this has just been probably months in the making, and there there are a few uh, you know uranium squeeze handles that 
have been brought up within the Reddit forum. So I think there is some sort of irrational buying and selling that's happening and that's driving the volatility within the stock. The other thing is, and I was actually on uh, CNBC a couple weeks ago talking about Cameco, the valuation is quite high. Uh, I think when you look at even looking at forward looking estimates, the stock is expected to build into its value uh, for sure, given what we're seeing on the nuclear power plant side and a lot of the positive developments there and the strong fundamentals. But it has been a pretty strong run in a pretty short period of time uh, in a market which was, I think if we uh, remember back, you know, one and a half, two years ago, was still a fairly soft market. So Cameco also said that uh, they had to step into the market to kind of buy up uh, uranium in order to meet some customer supplies. And they also said, uh, you know, they might have to buy 10 to 15 million pounds of uranium. So I think for all the good developments that we spoke about for investors that stepped into the space and some of the financial buyers like hedge funds, Cameco is facing some headwinds, I think, uh, both on the technical buying side and then also with their actual underlying business and the valuation currently. So I think some of it is a bit of an overreaction. If you look at Cameco, this is probably one of the better stocks to be in uh, in the uranium public equity space over the next three, four years, uh, even outside of valuation. But I think this is just a short term pullback. Yeah, I would suspect you're right. I mean, I look at the market cap of eight point two five billion dollars US. I mean, to me, that's I mean, Cameco is considered one of the uh, almost one of the only blue chips in the space. I mean, I'm sure there are other uh, candidates, but just in terms of its quality of projects and, you know, Western jurisdiction and on and on it goes, it seems like eight billion dollars is actually pretty reasonable. Yeah, I mean, there's really only two very large stocks in the space, and they kind of dominate, you know, Cameco and Pizadamprom, uh, which is the state-owned entity from Kazakhstan. So aside from those real blue chip stocks, I mean, the space is sort of tough to invest in because a lot of these stocks are still like small to mid-cap stocks. So, you know, for a lot of the reasons we've spoke about uh, uranium being a little bit opaque and kind of having a small public equity cap, these are the stocks where a lot of investors tend to jump into right away uh, when they are bullish on uranium. So I think some of the effects of maybe Cigar Lake last year are still weighing on people. It was shut down twice. Um, it does supply about 13% of the global uh, uranium production. And then also Cameco, because of the shortfall that they previously had in having to supply some of their customers, they had to step into uh, the market and start buying some of that up. So I think there is maybe a bit of a pullback in the euphoria that we saw earlier, just because margins may be hit. And then we'll see what happens with some of the uh, utility recontracting as well. Okay, very interesting. And now it's just a last thing on Cameco. I mean, my understanding was that part of the reason they closed Cigar Lake was because they felt that the market was oversupplied. And so they thought, hey, let's just, you know, they've been doing this for years, from my understanding, we'll just buy it off the market. And are you saying that in a sense with the price run up, they were almost caught offside on that whole trade and it started to work against them? Yeah, and Cameco is like a barometer for the entire industry. A lot of times what they do, we've seen other smaller companies do for different reasons because the balance sheet maybe isn't as strong and they don't have as many uh, resources to tap, uh, say the debt or equity markets. but Cameco, yeah, I think in a sense, it was sort of caught on the wrong side of that because the price run up has happened very quickly. I mean, some of it is because Sprott entered the market and uh, really started buying up, as we said, like about 28 million pounds of uh, uranium, which I don't think anyone could have really expected aside from uh, back in April when we heard the news about it. So I think Cameco was maybe a little bit surprised at how fast this run up could have happened because usually when uranium prices move, they move in a volatile way, but nowhere near as volatile as what we've seen recently. It's been pretty dramatic. Yeah. And so uh, looking at the rest of the space, so so what do you see? Like, uh, I guess, first of all, what's the outlook, say, on just, say, the supply and demand fundamentals? Do you expect this kind of uh, upwards trajectory to continue and maybe to, at a softening rate or at an increased rate or just um, who knows? Yeah, and this is the key question right here. I think this is really what's going to drive um, uranium for the next few years. So the market is in deficit right now. You know, if you think about supply, it's somewhere in the 170 million um, pound range uh, per year. 
and then demand is uh, somewhere north of that. So there is a market deficit right now, and it is expected to continue for the next few years. Um, it is expected to tighten, I would say, especially considering you know the run-up that we've seen and maybe new buyers that might start to uh, enter the space, um, and then new you know mining suppliers also on the junior side. So that is something that could start to tighten that deficit. But if you look at utility recontracting and some of the shortfalls in those contracts, and I think utility companies are starting to look at the big buying from you know, financial buyers like Sprott and some of the other hedge funds. And they're probably saying, well, we need to do this sooner rather than later, because otherwise, um, as you said, Adrian, like they're going to be caught on the wrong side of this and they're going to be paying higher prices, right? So I think you could see utility companies start to enter maybe sooner than they would have planned for um, just because of the big run uh, that we've seen recently. But even looking out beyond that, uh, over the next few years, there's still going to be a big deficit. In fact, unless you do see a lot of uranium mines start to open up or production really ramp up from here, demand is expected to outpace supply for the foreseeable future. And I think unless that really starts to get resolved, you could see prices hover north of 40. Um, I, I know they're around the $50 range right now, but north of 40 for you know an extended period of time, which I think is good for a lot of these companies because They've been uh, having to deal with 15, 20, $25 prices for the last few years. And it really hadn't budged from there, as we talked about with uh, the underperformance compared to other commodities earlier in the year. So I do think this could be a, a nice scenario outside of you know the recent technical buying that we've been seeing is the market is still very much in deficit. And I don't see that getting resolved anytime soon. Interesting. And my understanding, say, one of the main reasons we were in a uh, oversupplied conditions, let's say, for 10 years was because of Kazakhstan and their huge amounts of uranium that they, they flooded the market and basically killed the market. Do you think that they could basically return? My current understanding of this is that they have learned their lesson and they are not looking to oversupply the market anymore so that they will be a factor, obviously, but they're not going to do what they did last time. Exactly. And uh, they've announced this year that they're going to uh, hold back production growth uh, through 2023. So for the next mm. couple of years, they're going to be a ballast uh, in the market. And I think that's extremely important. I mean, we don't like to think of this as an OPEC-like industry because cartel gives a little bit of a a weird um, intonation to a lot of investors, but this is a very top heavy industry, right? I mean, we spoke about um, Kazatom Prom and then we also spoke about Pamico. I mean, these are the real heavyweights uh, within the space. And as they go, so does the entire industry, um, particularly on that supply side, right? Because they kind of drive a lot of uh, the production there and uh, what happens with inventory. So because we've seen a lot of really positive developments from Cameco, which you know had held back uh, Cigar Lake, as we spoke about, and also the uh, cap on production growth through 2023 from Kazakhstan, uh, this is also driving prices, right? Because you are seeing uh, physical spot market buying, but there really isn't any sort of a big outlook for higher supply from here. So I do think they've learned their lesson from the past few years. Um, some of it was you know, added their control after Fukushima because there was a big drop off and, you know, a big move away in sentiment from uranium. I mean, Germany, as we spoke about on uh, the, the last podcast we were discussing, um, they've kind of moved away from nuclear uh, just because uh, they don't really like it as much in the wake of uh, Fukushima. And then there's other countries whose attitudes have sort of shifted. But now a lot of that is starting to return back again, right? So you start to see uh, utility buyers financial buyers and also uh, Cameco and Kazatomprom now holding back production, uh, that's a really strong positive for the industry. Yeah, that is a big deal. And like you said in your last interview, the ESG push has, it has also helped uranium as of late. At least that is the branding, let's say, that Cameco and a lot of the industry has put on uranium, that this is the green choice, that if you care about climate change, you should be uh, interested in uranium and nuclear power. It's funny though, the memo, I'm here in Germany, and I was just hearing how the Green Party is not necessarily a big fan of nuclear power though. So the memo is still getting out there and maybe there is still skepticism towards that. I think this might be probably the most important long-term thing for uranium is the ESG industry and uh, sort of its association with it. So this is the question I get asked the most from investors is, 
what's it going to take for uranium to grow in the long term, not just what we're seeing in the short term. And it's going to be that ESG industry. I mean, even on the investment side, ESG is a $50 trillion industry right now. So even if you start peeling off some of those, you know, oil and gas asset money that right now is not really in favor and we're seeing investors kind of move away from, if you start moving some of that, even a slice of that into the uranium space, I mean, we spoke about how really there's only tens of billions uh, in public equity market cap for uranium. I mean, that's going to be a huge driver for uh, valuation growth and multiple growth, um, just as we see more investor dollars allocated towards the space. And then on the like power plant and the nuclear side, even though you know Western Europe and the United States and some of the more developed countries are not really expected to be like the primary drivers of growth over the next few decades, the real source of demand is going to come from those emerging markets. So China is the most prominent example. Um, India, Korea, and what we've seen is uh, you know a big reason for that um, being the need and sort of the desire to reduce or almost eliminate uh, your net fossil fuel footprint. So we've seen China come out with very ambitious plans to almost have a net zero fossil fuel footprint by 2060. And they've been probably the most aggressive uh, builders and planners of nuclear power plants. In fact, there's 50 nuclear power plants um, under construction, and there's currently 450 in existence. And a big um, source of that growth in the building of nuclear power plants is coming from China and India to an extent. So I think these areas with big population centers who understand that, number one, you know, without the greenhouse gas emissions, that kind of gets you to that uh, net zero uh, fossil fuel footprint goal, but also levelized costs and the costs relative to solar and wind which are comparable to an extent, but when you factor in the capacity factor, meaning how often the nuclear power plant can run, it's much closer to 100%. In fact, it's like 90 to uh, 95% on the capacity factor for nuclear compared to solar and wind, which is definitely, you know, about half that in some cases, maybe even less, uh, just because it can't always run all the time. So nuclear is both realistic and it kind of gets you to a lot of your goals as a nation. Interesting. It sounds like this whole space could easily 10x <laughs> when you just think of all this stuff. Speaking of which, I'm looking at next gen energy, just sort of final question here. And I don't know if you know too much about this, but obviously it's one of the kind of darling juniors of the space. And I just see a valuation. I mean, it's 2.75 billion Canadian, and that's maybe, you know, 1.75, 1.8 billion US. I mean, that's almost a quarter of Cameco, which has all of these projects that are producing. Do you know anything about Next Gen Energy? And do you see the same kind of exclamation mark that I do when I look at that market cap? Yeah, so I will caveat this by saying I'm not a single stock analyst. I'm really an industry analyst, which is kind of why I know some of those uh, big names out there, but a little bit less about the smaller names. But I will say, when we look at some of these smaller, more junior miners, I mean, if you look at the price of like Next Gen Energy, I just pulled it up. It was south of a dollar in the midst of the pandemic, and now it's closer to five dollars, right? So it's almost five x um, in a short period of time, and the reason is. When you think about some of these uranium stocks, especially the junior stocks, I know right now it's not really in the junior space because it's about a quarter of uh, Cameco's market cap. But at the time, if you do have a big run up in uranium prices, when you buy some of these junior mining uranium stocks, it's almost like a call option um, Mm -hmm. on some of these uranium companies because when the price goes up, they're not really taking a linear profit margin. They're almost taking an outsized profit margin, right? Because they do have a flat to maybe like slightly escalating cost base. But then when the price starts to go up, they take all of that profit margin, right? So that's why a lot of times when investors will jump into the space, even though companies like Cameco and Kazadam Prom are lower volatility, these stocks really have the potential for outsized performance in bull markets. Okay, excellent. And tell us about your Global X Uranium ETF. So that's a combination of companies. And does it include like, I don't know, the uranium uh, trust or what's inside the Global X Uranium ETF? Thanks for bringing that up, Adrian. It's uh, probably one of the most popular funds that we've had at our company um, in the last couple months. We run over 90 ETFs, but this one has been top of mind for almost everyone. It's a play on the entire uranium uh, 
vertical. So it has some companies across the entire supply chain. I mean, the biggest ones are going to be the miners, which make up the majority of the fund, but you also have some of the utility companies. We don't include the Sprott physical trust because we can't include trust technically within our ETF. So unless there's any changes on that side, that's why it's excluded from our portfolio. But the ETF is benefiting from some of what's been going on with Sprott almost indirectly uh, because some of those uh, equity stocks are actually doing really well because of it. A lot of the big names that are at the top, our largest holding is Cameco. Uh, so it's very much like similar to a market cap weighting. We're holding a lot of the large, very liquid companies. So it's almost like a beta play um, on the entire uranium industry. We're not looking for outperformance. Um, it's not actively managed, but it is a liquid way to enter the space. Typically it trades millions of dollars a day and it's US listed and secondary markets are uh, very tight and you can trade um, intraday as well, which is one of the benefits of the ETF structure. So we're not necessarily buying stocks that we think are going to perform the best. It's a rules-based passive uh, index that it's following. But for investors looking to kind of you know jump into this space and benefit from the broad market movements, that's where URA has really been seeing a lot of interest in. Yeah, I was very impressed when I brought up Cameco on Google Finance. I saw, oh, they also suggested the Global X Uranium ETF. So it sounds like you guys are doing well. Well, thank you. I'd love to ask you about commodities, but let's leave it for another episode. We'll have to ask you about all that other stuff you know about in the industrial commodities, which could be very interesting. Thank you, Rowan Reddy, for being on the program and sharing your interesting insights on the uranium market. Thanks again, Adrian. You know, I may not be invested in uranium anymore, but I sure am happy for, for all those investors who stuck it out. It had to be one of the hardest trades of the last decade. I mean, look at Cameco. I mean... I can't tell you how many times that looked like a buy and it never delivered. So I'm very happy to all of you out there who have persisted and now you're getting the fruits of your hard mental work. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to help out the podcast, leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory. Otherwise, share it with your friends and any students who might be interested in the mining industry. It's just looking at our demographics quite young. For our sponsors out there, if you want to get to the young crowd, this is how you do it. Until next week, take care.